Friends in Recovery, the Addiction Recovery Podcast, is brought to you by the Friends in Recovery Community, a thriving network of individuals who are fighting back against the stigma of addiction. Join our hosts as they speak up about the real issues of addiction, treatment, and recovery. Friends in Recovery, the Addiction Recovery Podcast, is available on Facebook, Podbean, iTunes, and YouTube 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, here are your friends in recovery. Welcome to episode 96 of the Life in Recovery podcast with me, John Loxley. I hope you're doing well out there. This episode of the podcast is with Jersey Ed, who is from the Friends in Recovery podcast, which I recently guested on. Uh, as always, it was a fantastic conversation. Uh, loved chatting with Ed. Could have uh, carried on the conversation for many hours. So I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation as much as I enjoyed speaking with Ed. <music> Hi, everybody. Uh, Ed, alcoholic and addict and friend in recovery. Um, and John, thank you for having me on the show. Um, I really appreciate it. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm just going to get right into my story here and just kind of kind of give you my experience, strength and hopes. Um, I do. I don't really dwell on all the shit. In the, can I say shit here? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't dwell on all this shit in the past because we all know um, you know what we did you know my story isn't really too much different than the the other people down the road you know we just we just end up in the same spot you know we end up in the in the recovery spot the lucky ones end up in the recovery spot i must say yeah. the ones that don't get it are the ones that may take too long to get it um death is probably an option now um for first and foremost unfortunately and um i'm blessed not to have that option today Will death come? Yeah, eventually, <laughs> but uh, but not the way that I was, you know, the way I was going. So um, just to give you a kind of a little background of what of myself, uh, grew up in uh, Jersey. Um, I am a New, a New York Yankees fan. I don't know if you guys know anything about baseball over here, but I am yeah. a New York Yankees fan. I got the tattoo to prove it. And um, <laughs> I, uh, so that's where I grew up. That's why my name, my nickname is Jersey Ed. And I uh, grew up in a normal kind of household family. Um, had a great mom that was codependent, had a great dad that was a drunk and um, boom, there you go. <laughs> Need I say more, but, uh, but it's very dysfunctional in my household and very, um, um, you know, kind of unsettling with uh, my dad drinking all the time. My mom always claiming, uh, my mom always claiming that we never have any money. My, my dad had a very successful business um, and, uh, but he was always drinking it away. So I guess we really never had money. So, uh, you know, if we, if I wanted my dad, I'd go to the bar. I knew exactly where it was. He was at, he was at the, at the red top, uh, bar and, and that's where we went in Cerville, New Jersey. Now I'm going to throw something at you here, uh, John, uh, Cerville, New Jersey, probably nobody, maybe somebody's heard. Have you ever heard of Cerville, New Jersey? Nope. Well, did you hear of a little band called Bon Jovi? <laughs> yeah. Okay, now you know Cerville, New Jersey. That's where he grew up. That's where I grew up. Uh, I went to the same school as his brother. I didn't know John at all, but I knew his. I knew his. Um, I knew his uh, brother Tony. Not well, just you know, going going to school with him, just passing in the hallways. But that was it. Um, so uh, a little that a little bar. little band, that little band Bon Jovi. <laughs> little yeah, a little band Bon Jovi. Yeah, there, there, there. Listen, listen. If I had hair like him, I'd have all the money like him too. But yeah. <laughs> I decided probably, not to have the hair. <laughs> probably be dead now, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> probably would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but he does a lot for New Jersey. He does a lot for um, the community. So thank God for him. He he does a great job in New Jersey. So. Um, and that's in the States, of course. But, um, you know, so this little bar in Cerville, New Jersey, I would, it would, it was my home. My dad would pick us up from the, from school. We went to a Catholic school, you know, normal Catholic school, um, pick us up and, uh, we'd sit at the bar. John, I had 
burgers for dinner. I had French fries. I had chicken wings. We had pickles at the bar. It was cool sitting at the bar. There was a phone booth. Some of your listeners may not even know, know what a phone booth is, but there's a <laughs> phone booth there, a pinball machine, a pool table, and get this, a bowling alley, a five-lane bowling alley. Yeah, what, more could a, what, what more could a, 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 a fifth grader ask for? right? <laughs> Not much, <laughs> right? Spending time with your dad, you know, all this stuff. But little did I know, um, you know, he was there to drink, not to be with me. And that's where the confusion, I guess, got into my head. I had two, I have two sisters too, where the confusion got in my head saying, okay, so this is how life is supposed to be. This is how dads and sons are supposed to get together. I'll be honest with you, John, I never played baseball with my dad. I never threw a, a pitch to him. We never tossed a football that I can remember anyways. Um, so I never had that experience. I had the bar experience. Now I hold that near and dear to me now because uh, that's all I have my dad. My dad passed away on my birthday, Jesus, seven, eight years ago. So, um, but, you know, I hold that near and dear to me now because that's the only memories I have of him. You know, I mean, obviously, as, as I grew up, there was other memories of him drinking and all that, but they were the fun memories, you know, but little did I know that was going to take me into a different world, a different world of addiction, um, different world of um, not, you know, not being a good family man, a different world of not being a good dad. Um you know, and, and that's kind of where that took me later on in my life. But um, kind did you, of uh, I should just interrupt you. Did your dad die from alcoholism or did he just different? Um, different. He, he he passed away in his sleep. He um, he 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 had a stroke and he would he didn't have a stroke and die of the stroke. He had a stroke and he lived for seven years after the stroke, but he never took problem was he never took care of himself. He did stop drinking. The doctor told him to stop drinking, but you know, you know, as well as I know, John, if we can stop drinking, but if, if we keep those, you know, behaviors still going, it's still not, not good behavior, you know? Yeah. So, so they ended up finding him dead in Florida in his, in his bedroom. He was in a nursing home um, with no money, the typical drunk story, you know, he ended up going from making a ton of money way up here um, all the way down to a nursing home that was taking all his inheritance from my grandmother, just so he can have a little room. And then he, he died in the room, unfortunately. Um, and that's where alcohol takes everybody, guys. That's where it takes you. That's where that's where alcohol, I don't want to tell you where the heroin takes us. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, thank God that's not part of my story. I never got into that, but um, I'm more of the more of the drunk. Um, so just, uh, you know, just just my just the fond memories of my dad and all that. And and then the dysfunction of my household when my mom asked my dad to leave. I was in eighth grade. Get ready for this one, guys, because this is going to be a bestseller one day. My best friend moves in and marries my mother. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I am not making it up. I swear, I swear, I swear I'm not making it up. Yeah. When I, he, was, he, was, he was my best friend's brother, but we had this clique. He was part of this clique. And, you know, one day him and I and, and all the guys are throwing footballs around. Next day, Gino, you want to come out and uh, have a, throw a football? Uh, no, I'm going to do the dishes for your mom. I'm like, oh, all right. That's a little weird, but okay. We're still playing football, you know, sixth, seventh grade, playing football, eighth grade. He was about four or five years older than me. So he was, my mom was legal. Okay, everybody. So <laughs> <laughs> he was a little, I think he's a little over 18, but he was in that clique of ours. You know what I mean? And then you want to talk about getting fucked up, you know, and getting, you know, kind of like this guy is now in, in my house where my dad used to be. Um, granted, not that dad was the best father in the world, but hey, a dad's a dad, man. You can't, you know, you, you, you can't kind of switch him up and have a better dad. You, you only get one. Um, and then, then next thing I know, he's in the bed with my mom, you know, so it got really, really weird. So unfortunately, that didn't go well. So at the age of 17, him and I duked it out. We beat the shit out of each other. Um, and I left the house. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, wouldn't, drinking the whole while and all that. So I wouldn't have know. expected anything less to be fair. Would not, yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I was not the best kid in the world. Let's let's make mention of that. I was drinking, smoking pot, you know, sneaking out, just doing everything that I thought was right as that a teenage kid should do, you know. But it wasn't unfortunately and uh and i was acting out i was looking for attention the whole nine yards and i didn't want to be there that just was not a safe place for me anymore you know so i ended up um moving into my grandmother's house um she took no before i moved to my grandmother's house i ended up moving into a uh 
a trailer um, <laughs> of my, at my best friend's house. We had a great time, man. We had parties every night. His mom really had no clue what was going on. Um, we had so many biased beer all the time. To, he plugged the, the camper in. So we had a refrigerator. We had electricity. We had everything. And then she found out I was living there after a couple months. And I got kicked out. So um, got some stability at my grandmother's house, which was cool. Um, and uh, But she was also, um, she wasn't one of us, but she should have been one of us. Um, and she drank a lot. And um, she was pretty strict about things um how to go to school which sucked I mean, but hey 17 18 i guess you have to go to school um and then uh but you know i did my thing start getting the cocaine early on too uh, i'm an 80s kid um not to have any 80s hair left but um I'm, I'm an 80s kid so a lot of cocaine um a lot of booze a lot of you know just big hair and uh and um heavy metal bands. That's, 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 that's what my life was when I was early, early uh, in, in my early days. So um, I didn't graduate from high school, um, drank all the time in high school, the, you know, the typical stuff. I don't, you know, it's just kind of the typical insert story here and, you know, equal drunk out here, you know, and, uh, but um, graduate, I didn't graduate. I, I, I made it through high school. I, I did take a summer course when I graduated, uh, <clears throat> I I was my my grandfather. One thing that John that that really helped me through and up until this day, actually, uh, my grandfather was a very hard worker, and my dad was a hard worker. I came from a family of very very hard workers. My grandfather worked in a factory in uh, in New Jersey, um, in Cerville, New Jersey, for forty five years. Um, you know, did his whole thing there. Never probably never missed a day. Um, you know, was was just a hard worker. So I got that from him. He instilled um, that work ethic in front of in, in me. So probably about the age of 18, he wanted me to get a job at the factory. It's like, yeah, more money to go party. And cause listen, man, back then 18 and, and a factory job, man, you were making some big money, you know? I mean, and, uh, so I got the, I, I, I got the interview. I went in, got the job and, uh, <laughs> uh I had to go for the drug test way back when they were doing drug tests and I partied the whole weekend. And I was supposed to go on Monday to drug test. I'm thinking to myself, oh, shit, man. I'm done. There's no way, right? There's just no way. I disgraced my family. So I'm in there taking a drug test. and Because um, we, we, we were working with nitrocellulose, which was a, a very highly flammable um, material. So I guess that's why they drug test. Because most places never drug test way back when. But um, lo and behold, I got the job. <laughs> they, I passed my drug test. <laughs> I was like, yeah, this is you, cool. you. <laughs> <laughs> and the cocaine never showed up. Nothing. I was like, uh, this is great. This is going to be a great job. So um, I worked the overnights. I got drunk during the day, the whole typical stuff. Um, you know, then I met a woman uh, who, who turned out to be my first wife. And uh, she, she was, um, she was perfect for my addiction. You know, when I guess when you're searching out for a partner or um, or whatever in that in whatever part of your life you're at, you're going to attract that. And I was just a track. Not that she was a bad person, but, you know, I couldn't I couldn't see me being with somebody like that today because, you know, because of the recovery piece. But that's who she was. And we got attracted, had kids very early on. I had my first kid when I was 21 years old. I have four kids and one step stepdaughter. I have seven grandkids today that I'm very proud of. Um, life is good yeah. now, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, I, and I'm 35. I don't know how I did that, but <laughs> <laughs> still looking 30, good as well. Thanks, thanks. I'm I'm lying. I'm 36, but <laughs> um, well, Matt, the, the the first wife I'm guessing yeah. was probably of the codependent ilk as well, and uh, yeah. Yeah. easily easily manipulated and controlled oh, yeah. by you yeah yep. yeah i'm only absolutely. saying that because i relate because that's exactly <laughs> my story too <laughs> yeah yeah well that we attract we attract each other you know like the the good ones aren't going to come looking for me you know you know like i got hey i got a, pi a, pi a pile of cocaine and a bunch of beer you want to party well the normal ones are in college getting wanting a degree and want to go you know they stayed far away from me you know but um, she was a good, she was a good kid, but it just didn't work out. Um, did some stupid stuff. Um, you know, 
did what a typical addict alcoholic would do. If you don't like what you're doing, you just replace it with something or somebody else and got caught. And that's how, that's how it went. Um, at that time she was pregnant. She was, we had three kids and she was pregnant with our fourth kid, kicked me out of the house. I was 27 years old. Actually, she actually, she found me at the girlfriend's house. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. She picked me up at the girlfriend's house. Her and my mom came down and picked me up at the girlfriend's house. And I just had to admit to it. I knew there was something wrong. I knew like when I woke up that morning, I, I, I called her and I told her what was going on. And I knew there was something wrong. I didn't know what it was. I mean, everybody knew that it was alcoholism and a, and a drug problem, but we're usually the last ones to know. Uh, let's be honest, you know. Um, but um, and I told her the truth. And uh, back then, it, it, it I thought it was the right thing, and today I know it was the right thing. But <laughs> but when I had to get picked up by my mom and my my wife at my girlfriend's house. When you're in that car with an hour ride home, sometimes that, most of the time I was thinking it was not the right fucking thing to say. <laughs> take it back. I take it back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I swear it's it's my sister. <laughs> and I've not got a drink problem. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But anyway, so but you know what? Um it, unfortunately that time it didn't stick. Uh, she took me back. Here's the thing. I wanted her back, I wanted the kids back, I wanted my old life back not realizing I would have got my old life back, you know, and, and uh, not realizing I needed a new life. You know, somebody asked me, they, they, uh, in one, cause we do a friends in recovery. We do a bunch of um, friends in recovery meetings, um, two a day, seven days a week, um, noon and 7 PM uh, Eastern time. Um, and, and I'm on, I'm on the meetings. I was just on one today. I'm always on the meetings, but um they somebody asked me, would you would you ever want to go back before you started drinking and be that normal person? I'm thinking to myself, hell no, because I was never fucking normal, man. This is the closest to normal I've ever had is being in a program, being in recovery. This is the closest that I think what normal is. I don't even know what normal is. You know, I have a bunch of books back here. I can see if I can find one of the normal handbook, <laughs> but I don't think we're gonna find one. But the book that says the handbook for life. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> if I find it, I'll mail you a copy. If you find one, send me a copy. So Definitely. I've been looking for it for quite some time. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. So um although all jokes aside, I mean yeah. to an alcoholic, the the uh, the uh Alcoholics Anonymous big book kind of is that, you know? You're right. Yes. You know, yeah. it's like when that book was written, um, you know, God bless their souls back in yeah. the 30s. Um, I don't think they had any idea. Yeah. Uh, what, you know, like what they were writing really. I, yeah. And I mean, I, I've over the years, I've done a lot of kind of research into the writing of the book and, and I've done a lot of research into kind of addiction myself because I like you, I work in the field. And okay. And also a lot of um, research into kind of spirituality. And what it seems is that they kind of, um, they, they took all the spiritual knowledge available to them at the time from everywhere mm -hmm. they could possibly get that information from and just mm -hmm. put it all together in this one program, which was yeah. just complete and utter genius. Yeah, yeah, it just it's just amazing. And think about it, they didn't have the meetings like we have today. Well, now we have Zoom and everything, but even let's go before Zoom, and, and I know we're getting off the subject here, but this is a great talk. I love this, I love talking about the, the big book and everything, but they didn't have all the resources, all the meetings. They had to go from house to house and figure out like, where where's the next meeting going to be and they, they weren't at noon and 7 p.m every fucking night you know they were when they can scrap people together and figure it out and they came up with this amazing amazing book that still probably hasn't changed much in all these years now 80 what 83 years i think yeah. founders day was just passed i think it's 83 yeah yeah so, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and yeah. um you know and I, I kind of i kind of subscribe to the viewpoint that it shouldn't change either because I think that there's plenty of interpretations out there of it. Oh, so yeah. It isn't like, you know, if you really, really, really disagreed with the language in there, you know, you mm -hmm. could take it and like make your own version and just change yeah. the words if that if that's what exactly. you needed to do. But, yeah. you know, like the kind of original text as it is. Yeah, I think that it just hits the nail on there, doesn't it? Everything in there is absolutely spot on. Yeah. Well, as we say in the meetings, and I'm, I'm not sure if you guys say, excuse me, say it there, it works if you work it. 
Yeah. So work it, you're worth it, right? I mean, that's that's what it does. And and those guys in the past trailblaze for people like us and people who are listening to the podcast, so we can have a clearer path, so we can not take the easier stuff the way, but don't have to struggle as much as the old timers did. Don't have to, you know, don't have to really, um, you know, not put the work into it because we do have to put the a lot of work into it. But that that trail was blazed for us and we just have to follow it. And if we follow that trail and we do everything, if I should say we, if I do everything my sponsor suggests to me because he did everything his sponsor suggests him and so on and so on and so on, you'd probably linear it all the way back to Bill. Um, you know, I know where I'm going. I have a roadmap because of that book. I have a life because of that book. I know at any given moment where my life is going. If I'm an asshole, I know where it's going. If I'm, if I'm, <laughs> I know where that 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 road's going. If I'm a, if I'm a good person, I do good deeds. Or if I, if I just stay status quo, if I push it harder, or if I push it less, I know where I'm going because of that book. That that book gives me the roadmap to to my future. It really does. Yeah, I agree. The yeah. only thing I disagree with, um, not that you've said it, but I disagree with some people that say in recovery is that. The only thing that you need is everything that's in the first 164 pages. I believe that there's a lot of other good stuff out there. You know, there's a lot of good texts out there that you can read yeah. and that can really like broaden your horizons. And because I mean, I, I kind of in my early years in recovery, I kind of stuck to just the big book and then I started to branch out, you know, and look at other yeah. um, programs and other like writing from other kind of uh, teachers and stuff. And mm-hmm. I've learned loads of stuff. And I've also got been through the 12 steps in, various other fellowships yep. that do it yep. slightly differently and yep. again learn you know i mentioned on your podcast actually that i joined a new fellowship of emotions anonymous and oh I've yeah yeah, been, that's right. yeah yeah and i've just been through the 12 steps um in that fellowship and i went through it quite quickly really like with over about the space of a month um, wow, okay. and it was and it was you know massively helpful you know it wasn't the same as when I did the, when I did the steps, you know, years ago, it was completely different. Um, and it was done in a different way, but it was brilliant. You know, yep, absolutely. There isn't yeah. a one size fits all, I suppose is what I'm trying to say. No, 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 no. And I, I do agree with you about the first 165 pages. What is it? hundred? Was that it? It's 165, 160, 160, 164, 164. Okay my brain isn't working. I'm moving. I'm doing, it's just uh-huh. like, I'm like, I don't even know if I have a big book anymore. It's probably packed in one of the thousand <laughs> boxes in the other room. So, but, um, but in the first 90, to even the first year, maybe even the first two years, stick to that, stick to that rule, hands down, stick to it because you don't need to know anything else. You no, really you don't. don't. That's very true. You, know? yeah. you, you don't need to know anything else. Once you get out of the fog and once you clear up, then you can take that knowledge, you know, and that knowledge, for me, being all these, you know, a few 24s under my belt, I'm branching out into, you know, spirituality, uh, um, you know, kind of, and, and I know it sounds a little quirky, whatever, Tony Robbins and yeah. different stuff like that, where we're life I'm coaching in, stuff, life coaching, all that stuff. Yeah. And, and, and it's helping my recovery immensely, you know, immensely. So, um, and, and I even had a, a, a spiritual awakening in recovery uh, last year. And, um, you know, I, my spiritual waking is, um, I went to a Tony Robbins conference um, in Palm Beach, Florida. It was probably a year and a half ago and literally right before the pandemic. And um, I had a lot of, not, I, I wasn't on a relapse mode. I was just in a bad spot. We all get in bad spots once in a while. And I didn't know how to get out of this one. I, my best friend just died. Um, he was actually my employer also. Um, you know, I work for a small little tiny treatment center down in, in Florida. And, um, you know, him and I just, I, I knew him for the last 16 years of my life. And, and he died of brain cancer. And it was oh, horrible to watch, you know. And then, you know, my jo- is my job safe? You know, who's taking over the whole nine yards? And it's fine. Everything worked out fine. But um, I, I didn't want to be alive at some point, you know, <laughs> right before the pandemic. And I went to this Tony Robbins um, uh, workshop and kind of turned everything around, you know, kind of turned everything around. And thank God, because two weeks later, boom, the pandemic hit and I was locked in my house. So if, if you're telling me, I mean, if you're telling me there's not a God, I'd have to disagree or a higher power because I could have not set that up 
more perfectly. You know, I don't know if I would kill myself. I don't know if I would have off myself, but I'm telling you, I would have been a miserable fuck, you know, <laughs> and, and it really, I mean, it just, you know, but it really, that really turned my life around. So that's some of the, I guess, offshoot stuff that, that I would definitely recommend. But like, like we said earlier, stick to those first 164 pages, the first couple of years or whatever, you know, whatever it is. So, and then if you want to branch out into anything, go into the stories, into the big book, you know? <laughs> yeah. And also there's the 12 and 12. I mean, when I went through the, 12, when I went through the program the first time with my first sponsor, I mean, he took me through the, the one, six, four and the 12 and 12 at the same time, because he felt as though yeah. um, the, you know, the 12 and 12 really uh, broke down and explained each step. And that really worked yeah. for me. Like yeah. I, I really appreciated that. And I felt like, I felt like I really understood each step. I mean, and to be honest with you, Ed, I've, I mean, I haven't had the most conventional of recoveries, you know, I've shared on this podcast uh, quite a few times that like I, I've even uh, been due to the research that I did for my first book, Addiction Prevention back in 2015, I've even uh, been down the psychedelic route um, similar mm -hmm. to Bill Wilson. Cause I know he did some experiments with yeah. LSD yeah. I've I've used um, ayahuasca and also psilocybin um, once each uh, over the last mm -hmm. few years. Okay. And they were two of the greatest spiritual experiences I've had, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it definitely isn't a one size fits all. No. And, you know, there's there's lots of avenues out there. But you just mentioned the crucial thing for me. And, and I want to talk about that, which is mm -hmm. a higher power, you know, for me. Yeah. And this was this was the reason why I went down the psychedelic route was because due to my research, I wanted to understand whether that was an option for people yeah. who were finding it difficult to find a higher power. And yeah. what I discovered through that mode of, um, you know, spirituality was that absolutely, you know, if you can't find a higher power and that's something that you're looking to, you know, to investigate, well, it was very, it was pretty, it cemented. You know, at the time that I did my first ayahuasca ceremony, mm -hmm. I was like already convinced that there was a higher power, but I had mm -hmm. no kind of tangible yeah, evidence of it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that, and that experience just completely blew my mind. And I was like, right, <laughs> I am totally <laughs> able to the convinced now. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, and, and today it's like, I don't question it. I just kind of, I just know that there yeah. is a power yeah. greater than myself it's as simple as that how did it how did your kind of faith come about um so i i i'm, I'm catholic was raised catholic catholic school the whole nine yards um so the faith was always there it was more book faith more of you know sister nadine beating me with a, a ruler or pulling my hair or whatever you know that's kind of kind of how it was but but my my faith today, my understanding of God today is way different than my Catholic school upbringing, way different than what God looks like. You know, I, I don't have anybody telling me what a God is. I don't, I can just create or understand, I didn't even create, I should understand my own higher power without a nun or a priest or somebody telling me this is, this is what you have to have. And it's not just the, uh, you know, take the hosts, you know, the body of Christ, blah, 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 confess your sins because you're a piece of shit. And then you become better when you're, you know, when you get, when you get out of that box and blah, blah, blah. And that's it. You know, I, I don't believe any of that stuff. I don't believe in broken human beings. Number one, I don't believe that there's such thing as a broken human being. Maybe we went a little off path, but a broken human being is tough. So if you're telling me that I'm sinning and I'm, I'm broken and I have to go confess something to somebody, another human being. I get it. I know that's part of our, our 12 steps, but, um, but you know, my God of my understanding, I confess to him or her or being, um, every morning I get on my knees every morning, John. And I thank God for what I have. I thank God for, you know, I was just sharing a meeting today. I said, I don't know if I pray, right. There's no book saying pray this way, Well, there are books saying pray this way, but is <laughs> that right? Or is that wrong? I don't know, man. This works for me. It kept me sober the way I've been doing it all these years, you know, and I'm not saying to do it the way I do it, but this is how I do it. And this is how I stay sober spiritually, mentally, financially, and, and, um, and, uh, I'm kind of, I'm kind of happy. I'm kind of healthy as far as that goes. You know, I'm not the richest person. I'm not the happiest person. I'm not the fittest person in the world, but I'm somewhere in between. I'm, I'm good with everything. And it's because of my higher power. It's because of my higher power, not, not what 
father Bob told me or sister Nadine told me, it's what I came up with. And that's when I realized that I can talk to my God the way I want to. I, if I want to say they are father, if I want to say act of contrition, if I want to say this, that's fine. But I can say, hey, God, I'm fucked up today. Help me. How do I get out of this one? You know, or, or how do I just get out of this feeling the way I'm feeling? Or, hey, just uh, want to send out a little prayer for so-and-so over there, you know? Yeah. Um, I was never told to pray that way. And now the way I pray, it just elevated my recovery hugely. So I think roundabout that's answer. Genius. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's not, no, that's good. I think that's the genius of the program, isn't it? Is the fact that mm-hmm. we can have our own higher power. Like yeah. that's what this, that's what it says, doesn't it? It says, find your own higher power and yeah you know like once you found that like you you essentially you know you kind of you're constructing in your mind what your idea of your own higher power is and whether mm-hmm. that's real or not it doesn't mm-hmm. really make any difference yeah. because it works you know yeah. if, it, if you're if you're staying sober a day at a time or staying mm-hmm. clean a day at a time then it's clearly working how yeah. did um, how did you end up in the fellowships then so what what was kind of your rock bottom so as I was saying before, with the uh, with the wife picking me up from the girlfriend's house, blah blah blah, um, I I'm like I remember my dad's drunk friend saying, if you ever get in trouble, and he he was a womanizer too. If you ever get into trouble and you're caught doing something you shouldn't be doing, tell them you want to go to rehab. So that's stuck in the back of my brain. I didn't even know what rehab was. I, I had no idea. So I said, yeah, I want to go to this hospital. I want to go to that. So the wife drove me to the hospital. Two days I was in there. I was like, I got this. Signed myself out AMA and boom, off to the races again. I got. I did get her back. We did do our thing. Um, and I was with her for about a year and a half drinking like an animal. Um, I convinced her that I was okay to drink and do cocaine again and you know, girlfriend came back in and every, I got everything back. I got my old life back. You know, I, I got it. What I, I got, what I wanted back. I didn't get the new life, you know? And uh, so a year and a half later, um, she picks me up again from the girlfriend's house. And uh, I was like, we got to stop meeting here. <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> but uh, I, I, you know, I just said I had enough and, and I knew, I knew that was it. I knew I was done. I knew, you know, just, I had that spiritual awakening. I knew at that point that drinking was my problem. I knew at that point that cocaine was my problem. You know, four kids at home, um, everything, you know, just living at my mom's house on government assistance, eating with government cheese and, and uh, you know, just spending money like crazy. I knew there was something wrong. And the minute I got to that hospital, it wasn't easy. You know, I mean, I struggled at the beginning, um, but I knew I had to stay sober. Um, got out of that time I got out of the hospital about five weeks later. And there's, and it's, it wasn't rehab. Wasn't like it, like it is today. You know what I mean? I, I had, I had a, a tough, a tough uh, stay at the rehab, you know, I didn't have all these fancy beddings and all that. I, I had a, a hospital bed. So, um, but uh, I ended up just getting so because of, because of that, that last, you know, that last stent and that last um, bottom, I guess, you know, that's kind of how I got sober. So. What and, uh, yeah? What did you kind of early days of recovery look like for you? Then were you kind of the were you the alcoholic who kind of like got into it, did the work, or were you like fucking about and you know not kind of getting into it initially? Um, no, I did the work. I was too scared. I didn't. I, I I'm telling you, John. March tenth, nineteen ninety four, was my sobriety date. I knew that I wasn't going to pick up again. I mean, granted, I, I I'm I don't. I don't project that. I don't say that's going to happen, but I kind of knew that I was not going to pick up. So to protect myself and knowing that I'm not, I don't want to pick up anymore. I jumped into it wholeheartedly. I, you know, counseling therapy, the other thing too, I'll be honest with you. I still wanted my wife back. I still didn't grasp that the wife was part. I don't say she was, she's the problem, but she was part of this cycle of the problem. And, um, I still wanted her back. So I was going to this meeting in South River, New Jersey on a Tuesday night at 730 called uh, the Fog Lifters. And there was three meetings. Now, I, it was a smoking meeting. The whole church, everybody smoked in the church everywhere, in the auditorium, in the classroom. We smoked everywhere. That's how crazy it was way back when. So it broke up into three meetings. One was a speaker meeting every Tuesday night in the big auditorium. A second was a step meeting. I didn't know what a step meeting was at the time. I didn't get into the steps too early on into my recovery. And the third was a beginner's meeting. I'm like, this is cool. I, we can you know, get into this. So every Tuesday night, I would go there and complain about my 
I'm not complaining, but talk about, I want my wife back. I want my wife back. I want my wife back. And they always had an old timer chairing the meeting. And we sat under those little tiny kid chairs, you know, and, in, in in, you know, we were sitting like this. And, and every time I raised my hand, you know, I still haven't got my wife back and raised my hand next week. Oh, I still got this, you know, oh, I want my wife back. I want my... So after about a year of, I guess, people hearing this, the, the old time that was chairing is I raised my hand. I said, yeah, I don't have my wife back yet. I think it's pretty close, which it wasn't. He's like, Ed, shut the fuck up. You're not going to get her back. I was like, what? I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, why am I coming to these meetings? And that's when I knew, right? That's when I knew that guy was right. I was pissed. I was angry. I didn't like what he told me, but it was the truth. That's what he told me. He told me the truth. And he also told me if you get her back, you're going to get everything else back. And I got scared and I didn't want everything else back. I wanted the wife back, but I didn't want everything else back. You wanted and, the wife, not the life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So little did I know I have a beautiful wife now. I'm married three times, but, um, but my wife now we've been together 15 years and uh, you know, I couldn't even pick out a, uh, couldn't even pick out a better wife, you know, ups and downs, you know, good times, bad times. She wants to divorce me. I want to divorce her. It's, you know, <laughs> in her heads, but you know, but that's how it goes. That's how life goes, you know? And, and that's the other thing the program told me. There's no perfection in this world. There's no happy, happily ever after, you know, we're, like I said, we're in the middle of moving and, you know, I, if you move, my suggestion is put a boxing ring in the middle of your house and have at it because it'll help with the frustrations and the anxiety and all that. It might work out better because moving is very stressful yeah. um, you know, amongst everybody. And, you know, we've been here 15 years and, but the program told me it's time to move on. It's time to start another life somewhere. It's time to, my, my last, my youngest daughter's is you know going to college and um is she in recovery your, your, your wife now or not she is not no no she she does work for genesis house where i work for and um you know we've been working for genesis house for the last 16 years she knows addiction inside and out um you know i put her through a couple of uh you know craziness you know she she understands it through me and um and some family members but um, but she's, uh, she's really, really good as far as, as far as, uh, recovery goes. She's, um, one, one of the best in the business helping people get into treatment. So cool. uh, I'm blessed on that, on, on that half. So, but yeah, so that's kind of how it went. And my life now is so good, John. I mean, it, I can't complain, you know, um, do I have issues? Do I have problems? Of course I do, but I know how to deal with them now. You know, do I have stress anxiety? Yeah, I do. I got a lot of that, you know, I went through two businesses in recovery, two wives, um, countless people dying in my life, but I didn't drink over any of it. You know, I was told if you stay sober a minute at a time, a day at a time, you'll get through whatever the problems are, you know, and those problems way back when, when I was, when I was um, drinking and using, I don't even know what they were. And at the time they were the worst things in the world. And I would drink about them. I'd use over them. And you know, you know what I mean? Now I couldn't even, I couldn't tell you one problem I had way back when, when I was drinking, you know? Well, it's uh, life's just a grind in it. And one of the, one of the kind of like epiphanies that I've had recently, like building on what you've just said is that uh -huh. the problem has always been the same problem forever. And that is yeah. just simply me. <laughs> that's yeah. All, yeah. That's, that's all it is. You know, it's just, <laughs> It's just my rea it's all about my reactions to my emotions to what's going on inside because like exactly. you know those emotions and the and the thoughts and everything that they're like they've they've been the same forever you know it's always like I need I need some new clothes or I need like I, I don't like the way that I look or mm -hmm. I need some new trainers or like I want to do this or I need you yeah. know whatever the thing it's always about me 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 yes. me 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 yeah. you know yeah. and and that's just what's been going on forever so as so recovery's taught me to just flip that and start thinking about other people and it, mm -hmm. it never became more apparent than when my daughter was born because mm. you know like 15 months ago when she came into the world obviously mm -hmm. you have that total perception shift don't you where you're like yeah. jesus christ like now she is the focus <laughs> <laughs> yes, like, yes 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 <laughs> she's everybody's focus and she's yes. my focus and it's like yes. you know the the stuff that seemed important just doesn't seem important no. anymore yeah you know? no so, no absolutely not you know it's, a, it's the transition isn't it it's the 180 degree turn from mm -hmm. selfishness to selflessness 
yes. in, in varying degrees, like as best as you can be on any given day, I suppose. That's kind of my take on it. Yeah, no, and you're, I have to agree with you 100%, you know, and, and uh, you know, those, but, but those, but, but you, but you were in recovery when she came around, right? Yeah, yeah, because I've been in recovery since 2010, so. It's, oh, okay, uh, good. Yeah, good. yeah. So yeah, I've, I mean, it's everything happens as it's supposed to, doesn't it? Everything yeah. happens for a reason. Like I got, I got an old girlfriend pregnant when I was. Uh, how old was I? I was I think I was like my mid twenties, and mm -hmm. uh, that didn't work out. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm just very thankful that it didn't, because I, you know, being a, I'd have been a father at a similar age to you mm -hmm. then, probably. I think I was about 24, 25, yeah. maybe a bit younger. And yeah. I just think, Jesus Christ, you know, like at that time, I was like getting drunk and threatening to throw myself off bridges and that kind of mm. stuff, you know? So yeah, yeah, I was yeah. definitely not daddy material. That's for sure. No, no. And I was definitely not daddy material. Even when I got to recovery, it wasn't daddy material. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's tough. And I, I, you know, even when they're born, even when you have a good head on you, again, it's a tough life, you know, to, to have a baby. It's a tough life to keep key thing. You said the focus is off of me and now on the baby, you know, everything's for the baby. Everything's, and I don't care what mind frame you're in. You're not 100% ready for that, you know, and uh, it's, it's tough, but you know what you, but because we're in recovery, we can adapt much quicker. We can have the less poor me time and the less, you know, all about me and more about them. And, adapt to it and move on and, and never look back you know as long as we stay sober you know and absolutely, uh, absolutely. That, that's the most important part of it what does uh, life in recovery mean to you then ed life in recovery means to me um happy joyous and free that's what it means to me i mean um i i really don't have anything more to say about that it's just happy joyous and free and uh just just being sober is just giving me a whole new world, a whole new, um, whole new outlook on life, a whole new perspective. And also I'm learning more. I'm learning more as, and I don't know if it's an, a thing as you get older, I thought as you get older, you slow down. I don't want to run marathons. I run ultra marathons. I, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm in this thing called YLR. It's a build your life's resume with, um, somebody here in the States, Jesse, I it's Eisler. Um, and I'm, I'm doing a hundred mile kayak trip down the, down the Delaware river here in, in, in the States. Um, I've never been on a kayak before. I think I have an hour and a half in a kayak. I'm yes. I'm trying to pack the shit in a kayak and trying to <laughs> get all my stuff. I'm like, I look at it and I'm like, Holy fuck. I got to spend five days in this thing. Like, <laughs> But you know what? It's okay because I can take chances. I can do things. Um, I would never do that when I was drinking or I would never even do that if I, if I, you know, my sponsor, like-minded people, like we, we, we make ourselves do things to improve ourselves. You know, of course, it's going to be painful. Of course, it's not going to be, I'm not going to be in my bed. I'm not going to be in my warm, comfy house. I'm going to be, I bought a tent. I never owned a tent in my life, you know, and <laughs> I bought a tent. <laughs> um, but but that's what makes us grow, guys. Early recovery, huge growth in early recovery if you do it right. I mean, huge growth if you do it wrong too, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you can grow either way, you know? But also, then you get complacent and you stop growing. And I didn't want that. I didn't want my stop growing anymore. I wanted to keep growing. So I turned it around again and I said, let's just do it. Whatever it is, you know, let's just just go out there and grab it. You know, I'm 55 years old and... um I don't plan to stop. I really don't. I, I just, I, I plan on helping people for the rest of my life. I plan on being active, eating healthy. I'm a vegetarian. Um, and I, that's something I decided throughout the pandemic. Um, and, and I enjoy being a vegetarian. Um, I'm not a vegan. I'll eat cheese here and there because some of that vegetables need some fucking cheese on it so I can get it down. <laughs> so, but over, overall I do, I do love, um, I do love, uh, I don't miss, I mean, I do miss eating meat. Okay. <laughs> I really do. I feel like a nice big steak on a grill, a, a shitty old hot dog and a, and a crappy old bun and squirt some ketchup on it. But I stand for something now, John, I can put because of Alcoholics Anonymous, because of my program, I can say, you know what? I don't need to eat meat because of what they do to the animals. They're never going to stop killing animals. They're never going to stop packaging them because Ed Chancho stopped fucking eating them. But I'm standing for something. And that's what recovery taught me. I can stand, sorry, get a little emotional. 
um, get emotional because I have my own thoughts of my own life now. Never had that when I was using. I was a slave to the motherfucking drug and drink. Now I'm not. So I can't get emotional. But I stand for something now. I stand for that, you know, that I choose not to do that today. And it's okay. You're looking what good for it as well, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sir. <laughs> well, Thanks. I've got two more questions for you. Ed. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. First one is how did you meet the podfather? <laughs> <laughs> So if anybody doesn't know, watch our show. I guess you have your, your shows, our, your show up that you did. And I said, the Podfather is on Friends Recovery. So the Podfather, I just met him through the business. Um, he's a retired police officer here in the States. And uh, we, at, at, at our treatment center, we, we, um, we, work with, we, um, we work with first responders. And he, he was referring people to us. Um, and we were helping him get sober. And... Uh, you know, when you're in business development, you take people out to lunch, you, you know, say hello, drop them off coffee, you know, shake hands, whatever. He always wanted to smoke a cigar. So that's how I got into smoking cigars. I, we, if you watch some of our early shows on Friends of Recovery, we're in a studio smoking cigars. And uh, and we ended up um, smoking a cigar one day. And he goes, you want to go upstairs? I'm like, the fuck are you talking about upstairs? Mike, I've been coming here for 10 years and I there's no upstairs. He goes, yeah. He goes, there's a podcast studio upstairs. I'm like, what the hell's a podcast? He's like, yeah, it's you just go up there. So we go up there's a gorgeous, oops, it's this gorgeous studio. If you guys look back in some of our shows um, on YouTube, it's this gorgeous studio that we had. Um, and that's how him and I just kind of hit it off. And he he kind of said, I'm the podfather. I'm like, okay, that's cool. You're the podfather. And we've been doing shows as him, the podfather is, you know, all these, all these years. So that's how I met Mike, just through the business. Mike's in recovery. Um, fabulous fabulous man that helps anybody and everybody he goes way above and beyond he's just a, an amazing person awesome that's yeah. wicked and the final question is sure um if you had one piece of advice to give anybody that was listening to this that was kind of struggling or thinking about making a change what mm. would you say Oof. Oof. okay don't quit before the miracle happens guys the old Chinese, old, old Japanese proverb, fall down seven, get up eight. <laughs> Seriously, right? Get up eight. Because we don't know when that time we're going to get up, you know, and, and when's the right time going to be, you know, yeah. don't, don't give up guys. My, my, I guess my, what I'm saying is please just don't give up because death is an option when we're doing this. Um, especially with the heroin and all the fentanyl and all the crazy, I don't know what you guys have over in the UK, but all of sure it, yeah. Of it. Um, you know, when we were growing up, I don't know what you use, but if it was alcohol, we kill ourselves slowly with the fentanyl, you one shot and you're done, man, you're completely done. So if there's anything I can tell anybody out there is don't give up, push through this pain. And there's a lot of pain. I had the pain just because I'm telling the story and I'm laughing and everything's good. Doesn't mean I didn't have the pain way back when. Doesn't mean I wanted, didn't want to quit. Doesn't mean that I wanted to give up. Doesn't mean I want to go drink and, and, put, and, and put it all away. No, it was there. The pain was all there. Just like some of you guys are going through now. It's there. You know, it was there. But I have the story where I can say I got through it. And I learned. I pushed through that pain. I learned. Guys, when you push through pain, you get you get you get you you get you know you get through it and then you get your your education and you get your your understanding of what that pain was for so and the rewards are endless aren't they oh certainly yeah certainly absolutely absolutely so beautiful mate it's been a pleasure um, yeah, thank you having a conversation with you um and uh where can we find you online where can my uh my listeners find your you guys so you can find us at um genesishouse.net and um, if you go under connections, all of our shows are on there. Um, or you can drop us a, an email at help at friendsandrecoverypodcast.com. Um, Facebook page too, um, Friends and Recovery Communities on Facebook, Friends and Recovery Adventures on Facebook. Um, drop, you know, stop by, say hello, like, subscribe, and, and you know, YouTube, whatever on for the podcast too. So a couple of different ways. Beautiful. 
Well, thank yeah. you very much for your time, Ed. It's been a pleasure and uh, good luck with everything in the future. Good luck with your move. Yes, and, thank uh, you. I'm sure we'll do another podcast again in the future. Yes, likewise. I'll get you on our show again, too. Cool. Nice one. Thanks, John. Take care. Stay sober, everybody. Thanks for listening. And if you've been affected by any of the issues discussed in the podcast, please see a range of mutual aid organizations in the show notes. Peace and love and goodbye for now. And goodbye for now. And goodbye for now. And goodbye for now. This concludes this episode of Friends in Recovery, the Addiction Recovery Podcast. Follow us on Facebook for past shows and updates and enjoy free access to twice daily support meetings. Friends in Recovery, the Addiction Recovery Podcast is available on Facebook, Podbean, iTunes, and YouTube 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Since 1992, Genesis House has been helping real people heal from addiction on their private recovery campus in beautiful Palm Beach County, Florida. Their family-owned program is accredited by the Joint Commission and offers detox and dual diagnosis treatment in a comfortable and confidential setting. At Genesis House, they focus on treating the underlying causes of addiction. Their comprehensive approach includes psychiatric care, individual and small group therapy, trauma healing techniques, and holistic care including yoga, massage, and animal-assisted therapy. After treatment, their clients enjoy the lifelong support of a nationwide network of Genesis House alumni. Call Genesis House today at 1-800-737-0933 to speak with someone who understands. Visit them on the web at www.genesishouse.net. It's time to start your journey to a long and successful recovery.